Thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to those watching on YouTube. Today, uh, we have a number of technical sessions around the CentOS project and our third session today is Prarit and John, or Don rather, I'm sorry, who will be speaking about contributing to the CentOS stream kernel. Uh, thank you so much for presenting today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Prerit Bargaba, Red Hat Kernel Workflow Lead and Distinguished Engineer at Red Hat. And with me is Don Zikas, the Red Hat Workflow Project Lead. And we're going to be talking about our plans for contributing to CentOS Stream Kernel today. Just a quick agenda overview. We're going to talk about the current and future state of the CentOS kernel development, as well as how we think contributions are going to be handled to the CentOS kernel. There are some restrictions on con contributors and we'll discuss those as well. We have some demos planned for the end, one for our tools and a slide demo uh, for CKI. And then we'll hopefully have some time, uh, hopefully for uh, Q&A. I'm gonna start by talking about what the workflow was and how RHEL and CentOS were created. I'm sure this workflow is familiar to all of you as the way that CentOS and not specifically the kernel has traditionally been built. However, and as the title of this presentation suggests, I'm gonna focus on some kernel things. This might be a bit repetitive for some of you, but I think it's important to understand how we were building the RHEL kernel and the CentOS kernel to show what we're planning on changing and improving. This first slide is very simple. It just shows the upstream kernel. We all know what the upstream kernel is. There's a mailing list where people contribute from many different companies and by themselves. The code is a constant state of improvement and those improvements are merged into a tree managed by Linus Torvald. That tree is commonly referred to as Linus's tree or the upstream tree. It's hosted on the Git server on kernel.org. There's a project that was in introduced roughly two years ago called Kernel Arc. This kernel project is constantly being rebased against kernel.org or Linus's tree. It pulls in all the upstream changes on a near weekly basis. This project is a combination of two things. The first is the Fedora kernel. It has configs to build uh, figs and sorry, it has configs and scripts to build RPMs, not yet upstream fixes in some cases, and a, a few other things for the Fedora kernel. This kernel is the one that's included in Fedora Rawhide. You can download it directly from fedoraproject.org's Koji server. It's also the place where you can now get an upstream face facing version of the RHEL kernel. We call it the always ready kernel or ARC and hence the project's name. Both kernels are maintained from the same Git repository and have the same kernel versions. Of course, the release is different. Kernel ARC has a maintainer, Justin Forbes, who continuously merges Linus's tree into the kernel ARC project. He simultaneously maintains both the Fedora and ARC configs to create two separate kernel builds. Speaking of the configs, the R kernel has the configs that match what we expect the next major release of RHEL to contain and contain some out of tree patches that both Fedora and RHEL require. This has caused us internally within Red Hat to do a significant amount of work to find maintainers for a bunch of unmaintained areas within the RHEL kernel. The kernel R project also will contain Red Hat specific changes that we need to make RHEL, well, RHEL. If you wanna get an idea of what the next version of RHEL might look like, you can now try the kernel arc project with the arc configs. There's a well-documented wiki associated with the project that provides details on checking out and compiling the latest arc kernel. I'll reiterate that it is very close to the upstream kernel. So it will also be useful de for debugging future CentOS stream kernel failures relative to upstream. Anyways, the arc project is snapshot at every three years to create a new RHEL major release. Right now, we're on eight and we're working towards nine. We test, harden, debug, et cetera, the code. This, and we submit fixes back to the upstream kernel, which are eventually backported into RHEL. And this gets us to one of our most important policies at Red Hat, upstream first. We follow a strict upstream first philosophy with RHEL. We try and get as much of our code upstream as possible, and that includes RHEL-only specific changes in kernel.arc. 
We do this so that we minimize rel specific changes. That type of code ends up being a burden on kernel engineering, which ends up maintaining that type of code. This is something we need all contributors to keep in mind. We're quite strict about code being accepted upstream before inclusion into the rel or R kernels. There are some very rare exceptions to this rule. For example, the kernel's reluctance to accept secure boot for code uh, into the into mainline. But in general, we require that your code has been submitted and accepted upstream before being applied to the rel kernel. Back to the model. As I was saying, Red Hat creates a major release every three years, and this slide shows that Red Hat creates minor releases every six months. These minor releases contain fixes and features backported from the upstream kernel. We do have some restrictions on features that we can take, but I'm not going to get into that today. It's really out of scope for this presentation. But we do update drivers, add features, test, and harden the kernel. Always following upstream first, as I just said, we push our changes upstream and get them back into the rel. Since we release every six months, CentOS is updated every six months. However, it's a step change rather than a continuous change. And that's one of the problems with this model. Fixes and improvements don't appear for CentOS users until after the release, and Red Hat doesn't get feedback from CentOS users until after the release. There's also another major problem with this model. CentOS contributors have had trouble contributing to the rel kernel. CentOS contributors often want to make changes to the existing rel release, i.e. after rel has been released, and cannot make changes until the next release because CentOS is downstream from rel. We cannot fix these problems while rel is the bleeding edge of development. Something needed to change in order, of, order for us to make, not take, advantage of the widespread CentOS community. In order to fix these problems, and as some of you know, we've migrated to a new model of development, the CentOS stream model. This is a new way of creating RHEL and CentOS stream, and we're trying to solve the problem of external, contrib contributor, uh, external contributors and testing feedback. In this model, the top two sections between kernel.org and Fedora Arc are exactly the same. Nothing's changed here. Just in the maintainer, rebases kernel arc up, up, upstream, adds some Red Hat specific code changes, configs, et cetera, and builds RPMs that can then be downloaded from Fedora's Koji. What is now different is that instead of creating a new RHEL kernel every three years, we're creating a new CentOS stream kernel every three years so that more contributors and testing can be reported by the community as well as Red Hat partners. In other words, we flipped CentOS stream and rel around. This means all development will now occur on CentOS stream and every six months, Red Hat will snapshot an internal copy of CentOS stream and release that as a new rel. That makes CentOS stream the bleeding edge and it's now public. This will make it easier for CentOS users to report bugs, provide input on the release and test. A quick side note, CVEs are security fixes in the bottom red box will first be applied to RHEL, and once they are made public, CentOS stream will be updated with new packages. We're still sticking to upstream first here. Our fixes will go to kernel.org and be backported into CentOS stream, and upstream first applies to security fixes as well. So we have two models, and we're migrating from one to another. What do things really look like today for RHEL 9 and CentOS stream? Right now, because we're still rebasing the CentOS stream kernel against upstream, the flow of code is from kernel.org to ARC to the CentOS stream kernel. It's being rebased roughly every week or so. Right now, CentOS stream, sorry, the CentOS stream kernel is a clone of the upstream kernel. Contributions for CentOS stream currently today can only occur through upstream contributions or to the kernel arc project. I'll have an example of that later on in the tools demo. In the fall, this model is going to change. What will happen is that we'll stop the continuous rebases of CentOS stream. CentOS stream will then become a fork of the upstream kernel and remain on a specific base kernel version for the next three years. We'll stabilize on a specific KBI, 
harden the kernel, etc., just like we always do. Upstream users will be able to contribute directly upstream and backport changes into CentOS stream. Upstream first. Every six months, Red Hat will create an internal snapshot of the CentOS stream kernel and release a minor version of RHEL 9. So how do we Red Hat kernel engineering and vision co contributing to the, Red Hat, to the CentOS stream kernel is going to work? The new CentOS stream kernel is hosted on GitLab. That means all contributors will need a GitLab account. Bug reports and feature requests are still made in Bugzilla, so contributors will also need a Red Hat Bugzilla account. As an aside, we've already made this migration internally for the RHEL kernel team. We have RHEL 8 hosted as a private GitLab project, and we've migrated away from an email-based patch workflow to you, you, that used mailing lists to a GitLab commit-based workflow that uses merge requests. We also have very specific requirements for the formatting of commits that are submitted for inclusion to CentOS Stream and RHEL. This document, which will be made public this summer, is called Commit Rules. Its purpose is to provide instructions for backporting commits from upstream trees into the CentOS string kernel. We've also written a tool called git backport that will format an upstream commit in accordance with commit rules so that it can be applied to CentOS string. I'll show you git backports in a few minutes in my demo as well. We also have other documentation that's going to be released for about the CentOS string kernel process available in early August. So keep an eye out for that. There are a few other things I need to tell you about. There are some restrictions to applying changes to CentOS string. Oops, sorry, I forgot my slot. Uh, there are some restrictions to applying changes to CentOS string. Since this is now upstream of RHEL, we are going to require that every change has a sign off from a RHEL maintainer. That is no different than what happens with an upstream kernel. They have maintainers and will have maintainers. We will have a mechanism by which contributors can find an appropriate Red Hat maintainer or RH maintainer for the code that's being modified. This RH maintainer will make an assessment on a contributor's changes, and if they find them acceptable, provide guidance and help shepherd the changes through the CentOS stream process. We also have some testing restrictions that Don will talk about in a few minutes when he does his demo for continuous kernel integration, or CKI as we commonly refer to it. Lastly, since RHEL releases on a six-month schedule, there are going to be times where we accept changes and some periods where we are a bit hesitant to accept changes. You'll note that I'm not saying we stop all changes. Someone could submit a valid security fix that we need to take or a critical bug fix that we need to take. But large changes, such as adding a new driver or feature, may be restricted at times. But as time goes on, we're all gonna get more comfortable with the release schedule and how it impacts CentOS stream and RHEL. I'm now gonna talk a bit more, a bit about some tools that we've worked on and do a demo with kernel arc and the tip tree. Why the tip tree and kernel arc? Well, as I said a few minutes ago, the CentOS stream kernel is currently a clone of upstream and it's not really taking code changes, code changes so I, I can't really do much there. Instead, I'm gonna use kernel arc. And since it's so close to upstream, I need to use another tree, the kernel's tip tree. But the process will be the same for CentOS string. I'm gonna show you an open source tool called Lab that we've been working on with members of the open source community. To be clear, it is not a Red Hat specific tool and it can be used for any GitLab project. It's a command line tool that allows you to execute GitLab web UI commands on the command line. We found it immensely useful in the kernel team because it allows us to quickly view code, submit merge requests, and approve code from the command line. We do have all this process documented internally with respect to the workflow. We'll also be releasing that documentation publicly in August, 2021. But before I do the demo, I again want to emphasize that we move the entire kernel team to this new workflow internally at Red Hat. We've we all have created GitLab accounts and are using the standard GitLab merge request workflow to submit commits instead of using email patches for inclusion into the RHEL kernel. The migration took a year of planning and months of work by the kernel team. 
It's paid off though. At last count, 98% of the discussions on code were being done in GitLab versus email. So let me get into get to my uh, dem demo to show you how somebody can, can contribute. Since Arc is close to upstream, as I said, I'm going to backport a commit from Linux tip into kernel Arc. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen, that uh, my my terminal. Um, I'm I'm in my copy of the tip tree, and I'm going to first show you this back the git backport command. And this git backport command, as I said, uh, will backport will create uh, will do a backport of a commit from one tree and allow you to use JIT AM to apply it to another tree. There are certain things that the commit rules, that document that I mentioned earlier requires. It requires me to sign off on, on a patch, to add an actual signed off by. I have to have a bugzilla number. I also, in this case, because I'm not going with the upstream tree, Linus's tree, and I'm using tip instead, commit rules says that I also have to specify a tree. And last, I'm going to be using this dash F option here for finding fixes. What that finding fixes does is when you pass in a commit into this command, it looks at the rest of the Git history to find if there are any fixes associated with it. Not only does it search for fixes colon, but it searches for the actual the, the short commit hash in the in other merger, uh, sorry, in other commit descriptions. So I am going to, uh, oh, one other thing I wanna show you is that these options can also be set in your global config. I have fixes set to look for fixes and a sign off and one other option called, called short. I've saved a commit ID off to the side to make the search easier. And I'm now going to backport this. Uh, the, I'll call it the commands in a second. It's, oop, I see what I screwed up already. All, uh, you can never type when other people are watching. Uh, dash T to identify the tree came, on, came from, find some fixes, add my signed off, and this is the bugzilla, and this is the hash that I'm going to backport. That creates this file. And... I'm going to show you that file. And you can see it creates a git am applicable patch. It says it's from me, provides a subject, has this has the bugzilla number that I specified, which was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, shows the upstream tree where it came from, and then includes, if I can get it the entirety of the upstream commit uh, uh, description. And lastly, adds in the signed off by from me. You can see at the bottom here th is the actual backported patch. I can then switch over to my arc tree. And just like I would with any other GitLab merge request, I first have to create a branch. I can then, again, using JIT AM, apply the output of the git backport command. I can then, just like I would with any other merge request, push the branch to my fork. This will, with GitLab, spit out a link that says this is where I can create a new merge request for this branch. But instead, I'm going to now show you the lab command. And I can create a merge request on the, on the command line. And I'm going to create a draft merge request just by typing lab mr create dash dash draft. And it will do exactly what it does on the web UI. At the bottom here, you can see it's saying that I'm merging from, I'm merging into upstream, the upstream OS build branch and from my fork and the COMR uh, uh, branch. I can save that. And hopefully it will have created 
I can again, it will create a merge request and give me the link. I can show that merge request to you on the command line. And there it is, exactly my merge request. I can also show you the code associated with my merge request. I'll show you the exact the exact patches that were that were there. If I had multiple patches, it would show me multiple patches in this command. I can also look at a list of open merge requests, and you can see mine is at the top, which is the one I just created. It also has to do support. So for if you want to look at your to do list, you can look at what your to do lists look like on the command line. And with that, I'll go back to my sh the presentation and hand the presentation over to Don. Thanks, Pert. I think Dave Arcari is pinging me and complaining about all these draft MRs you're sending him with way as a reviewer. <laughs> we'll get over it. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so Pert talked about all the, the workflow tooling stuff. I'm going to talk about the testing angle of this whole workflow. Testing is obviously important in the kernel. Well, that invested a lot of time and effort into a service called uh, the Continuous Integration or CTI for short. Service takes an MR, builds it, tests it, and reports the results. So we'll talk about how we work with this service on any MR you contribute. Next slide. The goal we have is to test every MR before it's committed. Think of this as a continuous integration service or CI that many folks are familiar with. So much change being included in the RHEL kernel is important to flush out as many issues as early as possible. Hence, every MR is tested. Remember, uh, you may not be aware, but we're doing about 20,000 commit changes every six months. So there are a lot of things go wrong. So we want to flush out as many, many low hanging fruit problems as early as possible. Now, to be honest, we do have two different pipelines for contributions. This is a new thing for us. So due to security concerns, we have an external contributors pipeline and an internal one. The Red Hat, uh, so the external contributors one, uh, Red Hat restricts what types of platforms we use by those MRs. Uh, we, we don't want use using internal webs, uh, the, the internal services or machines just yet. The trusted contributors, basically people who work at Red Hat, will use the internal pipelines and have access to all our labs. However, if a Red Hat developer pre-reviews the external MR and deems it safe, he has the ability to click a button and move the MR to internal labs for a more broad, broader uh, selection of tests and machines. So how do we know what tests to run? The kernel's pretty big. We could run all our tests on every MR, a waste of resources. So instead, we tried to create, create something called targeted testing. And the idea is to take each MR and analyze the patch diff and compare the change files to a database mapping the files to the test. This gives us a bit more control over the resources we use while still allowing a broad coverage of tests to be applied on the MR. The tool we use for that is called KPET. I will provide a link to that a little later. So like I said, every MR is tested. Now, what happens if a test fails? If a test fails, it will block the MR and will require attention. That is something you're going to see, and you need to act upon. Otherwise, your MR is not going to go anywhere. So how do you resolve these failures? This can be done in a variety of ways, and I'll discuss a little bit um, later on in some of the demo. But the end result is the failure must be resolved through an updated MR, updated test, or a test waiver. These test waivers are done by our QE team as they understand the test environment the best. And it's a little bit safer. We don't want developers waiving their own MRs. <laughs> uh, there's also a, a situation where uh, some MRs create new issues that have nothing to do with their MR. For example, you submit a PPC patch and it breaks an x86 machine. Obviously, those aren't, aren't related at all. So we have a thing called a known issue file. 
the QE file is a known issue, puts in a little string, and then you can waive the test. This allows us to uh, deal with other MRs that may run in the same situation, like oh, this is an issue we got to track, we're going to fix it asynchronously, but we're not going to block other MRs because of this one. So this also, I mean, the, the goal of that is to reduce the time folks need to triage the failure. So once we once an approach is decided on, either updating your test, if that's the, what the course of the failure is, updating the test, if that's if the test is a thing that broke, or if you have to do a, a waiver or known issue, once you decide on that approach, you retry the pipeline or the stage, and hopefully the MR passes and you can move things along. So let's see an example of how this all works. Next slide. So when you submit an MR, this is on the web UI. Obviously, uh, prior showed you from the text base, but uh, there's going to be times where I think he gives a, I think the pipeline ID is in there. But if I, I'm looking for the web UI for right now, but if you go on the web UI, you see two things. You got the, we're looking for pipelines. You see a pop in the red circles. There's a pipeline tab you can click on to get to the pipeline, or on the bottom circle, there's a link directly into the active pipeline. If you, re if you run this, uh, if you update this MR multiple times, you're going to get new pipelines for each update. So, and the bottom one shows you the, the latest one. And um, so those are the ways that you get to the pipeline. So next slide. You click on those pipeline links and you get to this page. This page shows you all the stages in the pipeline. Now, initially, because in GitLab, we use something called the trigger pipeline. You're only going to see the left two columns. But that red circle is, is an arrow. You're going to have to click on that to show the right side. Once you do that, you're going to see the entire pipeline stages. You can see like, you see the prepare, merge, build, we have build tools, set up, test, lots of different stages, um, all needed just to kind of move this thing along through, uh, through the end stage. And I think there's a report result stage at the end, too. Um, one, ask, one important thing to note in here, you, you probably see this was in the CentOS stream thing, is, and it's going to be confusing, is there's something called real-time checks in there. Red Hat also does the real-time kernel for various customers. These are checks to say if your MR is going to break the real-time kernel or co provide collisions. Uh, this check will occasionally fail. It, it shouldn't block your MR, but just note it that it's, it's something that if it blocks the, the real-time team, it notifies them, they get involved, and they help work with you on your MR to adjust things accordingly so they can continue moving forward with their project. But overall, this is what you'll see when you, when you click on an MR. Next slide. So I'm going to give you an example of a, of a build failure, right? So you, in the previous slide, there's all those stages in there, and they're all green, which is which is great. Every once in a while, you see something that's red. That indicates a failure, and you're going to click on it. Most of the time, those failures are going to be in the build or the test stage. Um, if this is a build failure, you're going to you click on that button, and you're going to get to a screen like this. You're going to see a black screen full of text, and it's going to be overwhelming. However, if you, if you scroll up a little bit, you will see a, a text that shows the last 25 lines of the build log to kind of give you a quick indication of where your build failed. If those 25 lines are not good enough, you, on that red circle is a browse button. It's a little small, I do apologize. If you click on that browse button, it will get you to some artifacts which get you to the build log. You go to the next slide. Here's that, that if you click on that browse button um, and click artifacts, you get to here and there. Here's where you see the build log. If you click on this, it'll download the file and you have the full build log from the RPM build and you can it help you analyze things a little bit more. In addition, there's a few other uh, things in here. There's the source RPM and the MR diff in case that's interesting to you too. Next slide. So the other scenario is a common scenario is a test failure. It happens a lot. So what do you do? You click on the, the red test button and you come to a screen like this. And there's again, once again, there's gonna be lots of text and it's gonna be overwhelming. So what the CKI team did is try to highlight the important things in blue. So if you scroll up on the screen, you're gonna see various blue links, like the one in this picture. And these are gonna indicate, these are links you click that are gonna need to log files that will help you determine what failed in the test. 
if that's not good enough or you need a, a broader set of failures, you can browse in the link. You can browse those artifacts too. One of the red circles, there's a browse button. You click on that. Next slide, please. It'll bring you to a page like this. You might have to click down a few links. You know, that, the top circle there kind of shows you the path to get down here. But at the bottom is a red circle. It says index.html, a little small. Again, I apologize. That index.html is the top level uh, log. It has all the statuses of all the tests going on and it has all the links to the logs. So that's where you want to start first. It's an HTML page. You pop, you pop that up, and it should uh, have pointers to all the individual logs. You can drill down to the failure pretty quickly. For those folks who are familiar with Beaker, it's an internal platform we use at Red Hat. Um, there's external instances out there. It is a public project. This is using a tool called Restraint to run all our testing. And the output in index.html is the same output that you would see on Beaker and Restraint. So if you're familiar with that environment, this index to HTML and all the logs of the files should be familiar. All right, next next uh, next slide. All right. So this is a lot to digest. Everything Prayer was talking about, and I was talking about. So luckily, uh, actually, I'm sorry. There's a lot of things I talked about first. I'm jumping ahead. The CKI team has provided lots of documentation. Uh, so here's a link to all the various documentation. We start at the top with exactly what he's talking about is you, you're testing an MR. How do you diagnose it? How do you walk through the scenarios? It's like I have that top link will help you out there. Very extensive. The next link contributing tests that points to our testing database that CKI uses to run their tests. If folks want to review it, expand on it, contribute more tests, We'd be excited to have that. We're always trying to increase the coverage. These are the same set of tests we run on with using kernel arc to apply to the upstream kernel tree. So any tests you contribute there, we apply to the upstream kernel and help upstream stabilize not only RHEL and CentOS stream, but the upstream kernel. So contributions are welcome there. KPET is a tool I talked about earlier. That's the, uh, the patch analysis tool. It takes the MR, patch diff, maps it to the correct tests. And there's the ckiproject.org website itself. This is the top level uh, domain, and it has a ton of information about what the service is, how to, how to interact with it, um, who to contact. Um, next slide. So today we talked about a, a workflow, the kernel workflow, and that's a, we call that a source Git workflow internally. And what that means is that's a traditional workflow that the uh, GitHub and GitLab, uh, Git repositories work. You contribute code, you interact with code directly. Uh, if you're for used to the Fedora space or even you know package maintenance in CentOS and, and RHEL, you're used to a disk Git workflow where you have a spec file, tarball, and patch, and you interact there, you apply patches, you rebuild the RPMs, and you, you submit it that way. That's a disk Git based workflow. And that will be part of the CentOS stream effort too. Um, this kernel was was focused on the source Git, but, uh, source Git workflow, and it gets automatically converted into a disk Git workflow on the back end. You don't have to interact with it. But the point of this slide is that there's other packages that are doing similar things, the virtualization team and system D. So if you have any, like if the kernel workflow is interesting to you, how we interact and how we do all this stuff at a source Git level, there's other teams that are doing the same thing. Feel free to interact with them. There's also a service called Packet. And it's also taking trying to take all the CentOS stream packages, the disk git packages, and automatically converting them to source git packages. So developers such as yourself can easily contribute in a normal style to these packages in a source git way. Uh, again, feel free to interact with those as you see fit. Um, next slide. So there we go. Final thoughts, some wrap up. So again, we, we, we did talk, talk a lot about uh, various things today. Prayer had a very good overview of how the, the new model is going to work, how he does the tools and everything. And I talked about the testing services. So we just wanted to kind of just quickly summarize or highlight some of the, the key points of this whole talk. Again, CentOS stream is bleeding edge. Okay. All our RHEL development is going to happen in CentOS stream first before it lands in RHEL. 
Kernel Arc is a place to be right now for emerging RHEL 9 kernels. If you contribute to Kernel Arc right now, it's going to land in CentOS Stream 9. If you're excited to participate in this kernel workflow when it goes live in a few months, we suggest you get a GitLab account and a Bugzilla account ready to go before you contribute. Commit rules and documentation, that's, they'll be coming in August. These are the, the rules that you need to follow in order to contribute to the RHEL kernel. If you're familiar with the upstream kernel, a lot of these rules are very similar and it, sh it should be only a few tweaks and adjustments um, that you need to concern yourself with. Red Hat recommends a tool called Lab. If you're a CLI person, like a lot of us, Lab is a place to be. We, Red Hat's gonna maintain it, support it. Um, any issues, we'll go right to prayer. And we recommend that. <laughs> CPI is our testing service. And that's gonna be all, all, all the interactions of your MR will go through, we'll go through CPI for, for the testing purposes. And, Those are the important highlights. Next slide. That's it. Thank you. And uh, I see we've already got a bunch of questions and thoughts. Um, let's open it up. Should I read the questions or is Rich? Um, yeah, either way works. We do have a number of questions in the Q&A. And, &A and uh, I guess uh, we'll start with how are you managing tool, chain, tool chain drift, where the entire build chain has to match for an external kernel module to be built or loaded? That's easy. Then KSIMS. <laughs> so what, what does that mean? That means uh, the Fedora kernel today is uh, when you build a module, it has to, it uses uh, the, the, the build tools, embeds a build tools uh, signature into the module. So any Again, any tool chain drift immediately gets noticed, and it, it won't apply the next the module to the next uh, update of, of the door kernel. Whereas RHEL, we use something called Gen KSIMS, which does checksums, which analyzes the uh, file built to checksums checksum string. So the idea is if, if the tool chain updates itself, as long as that checksum isn't changing, which means the code drift isn't changing, the modules continue low, and that's that's a core functionality of our KBI technology. Uh, next question. I can read that. Um, how do you see the CentOS plus kernel config be handled, assuming that RHEL kernel maintainer would reject an MR to enable, for example, a driver module? Would it just be a CentOS plus branch? Great question. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm guessing that's that's where the SIGs come in. There is a CentOS yeah. thing, SIGs. Uh, I would take it to them. Um, we haven't really flushed that out, but that's a great question. We probably would create a, some sort of branch or something, uh, but that's a SIG question. And let them figure it out. They'll come to the kernel team and we can discuss a solution. Next question. CentOS Stream 9 is the door 34 based, but CentOS Stream 9 kernel is, I'm going to guess, newer as, as a Fedora kernel. Why? I can take this one, Don. I mean, I, I just did it. <laughs> um, Urkan, I think I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Urkan, uh, the issue is right now we're continuously rebasing CentOS. Uh, sorry, the the uh, uh, CentOS Stream Nine kernel right now against uh, upstream, so it will be farther up to date than Fedora 34, which is a month old ish. Uh, so it's going to be continuously rebased until August. I think we're aiming at 5.15. I, I, that somebody, I'm, I don't know what the number is going to be anymore. It's, it's so, for debate. But. Yeah, but that's why, Eric Hahn, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Wander has asked, will Kernel RT follow the same workflow? Yes, and in fact, uh, they are more into the GitLab workflow than even the regular kernel team are. They're a little bit ahead of us in that aspect. Well, um, it's a small tweak. People don't contribute to real-time workflow. They have a they have a monster yeah. patch that apply on top of it. So every time they're constantly merging with the, the rel workflow. Yeah. So that's why that we have that CKI service kind of on the side, is just to make sure they don't we don't conflict with their their monster patch. 
Now, right. hopefully, RT will get their stuff merged upstream, and we won't have this. It'll just be a separate config option in, in the kernel. It'll just be a, a typical kernel variant. But <laughs> cross our fingers. Um, I ins uh, this is from uh, Mikhail. Uh, if uh, I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anybody's name, uh, especially with my name. Uh, I, I should apologize up front. I understand the importance of keeping a stable kernel ABI, but could an alternate kernel based on the latest LTS made a, be made available too, with lower guarantees on ABI stability? That is a question again for a SIG. Uh, you're going to have to discuss that with the SIG and then bring it to the kernel team. I, I, I mean, it's, it's possible I, I don't know, though the probable uh, question would be answered by the same. So her, here's a trick. I, I think people get confused on the LTS support. LTS is like you snap a kernel, let's call it 512, right? Let's pretend 512 was the LTS score, and he goes and it just keeps applying stable patches on top of that. RHEL doesn't do that. RHEL needs to continuously update, have uh, support bleeding edge hardware. So we're applying 20 or 40,000 patches every update to support new hardware. It's something LTS doesn't do. So you can provide an alternate kernel with LTS, but the performance guarantees aren't going to be there. The hardware support's not going to be there. So it's, I don't even think we would even throw the word label on there or CentOS stream. So again, yeah, you might have to go through a, cent, a CentOS SIG, but um, yeah, it's going to be tricky. Um, from Ladar, uh, you mentioned the rel specific changes and hardening that is added to the vanilla code base. Can you provide a high level overview of what those changes are? Uh, I can take this one, Don, certainly. There, there, there are a broad set of changes. There are, uh, one of the things that comes to mind instantly is we do something called KBI padding to future proof our kernel from later changes. We may have features, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, the, uh, 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 my, uh, the uh, what was it? The signing code that upstream didn't want to take it for a long time, and we ended up having to carry it in rel uh, for secure uh, purposes. So it's it's quite there. There have been other cases of that over the years. Um, we've made modific minor modifications to drivers based on partner uh, uh, hardware companies' requests. But I, I'll say this: at last count, nine. 98% plus of the ship rel kernel is upstream. There are some, again, very rare exceptions to breaking that rule. Uh, and they have to be very, it has to be a very significant case for us to consider breaking the rule. If folks are interested in seeing those changes, it's, we, in kernel R can make it very easy because Fedora wants to disable most of them. Yeah. <laughs> Justin's not a big fan of them and rightfully so. If you go look for config underscore rel underscore differences, um, that's wrapped around all or large majority of the rel only differences. You look in the code for that, and you'll you'll be able to determine what those changes are. There's actually a config option. You actually flip it off. So if you don't want the rel only changes, you just flip it to no, and all of a sudden you get more more vanilla like. Uh, and last one, a follow up question from Michael, who asked the stable KBI question: For SIGs wanting to build their own kernels. Will they be able to share the signing mechanism? I know Hyperscale is interested and is blocked on this. Uh, so it's with signing mechanism. If you're if you're talking about a uh, UFI, is it no? Is that UFI signing is or the module signing? I guess. Uh, Michael, Michael, could you answer that question? It, it, it would help us if you could in the Q and A. Just give us an answer to that. Are you talking about UEFI secure boot signing? Exactly what are you talking about there? Is it in the chat? Um, Secure boot signing, yes. No, we can't uh, share the key. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we won't share the key. Uh, there, it's just too much of a security risk ob for obvious reasons. But um, I think my understanding is secure boot is you, you can load multiple keys into your kernel. So if, if Hyperscale wants to... Uh, well, I guess if they want to sign their own kernel, they can put their own yeah. provide their own key. Uh, the, yeah, the uh, you can you can add a mock key, M O K key. Uh, I forgot what my brain paused on what the mock acronym stands for, uh, but that that's pro that's a suggestion for hyperscale. Add their own key.
Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Prior and Don. And uh, we now have a, a short break between this session and the next one. And uh, our next session will be Nickel talking about Sento stream on the desktop or how I learned to stop worrying and love LTS. Thank you uh, all Rich, for attending and for your questions. Yeah, go ahead. Let me say one, one last thing to Please everybody do. here. I, I, I don't, I've, this is my first CentOS dojo and I, I, I'm 100% sure I've never met most of you. And I just want to say this from uh, like from a personal point of view, uh, we're, we're really excited to be working with the CentOS community. Uh, more than you would you would think. Um, I think that you've long had valuable input into the way we're using our using effectively RHEL that Don and I frankly lack that knowledge. And uh, anything we can do to help out on the kernel front, please reach out to us. We're we're we try to be nice. <laughs> That's the way I'll say it. Well, me, I try to be nice. I'm not going to say much about that Zikus character. Yeah, it's kind of shady. Only one, only one day a week I'm nice, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I just want to throw that out there. Please feel free to reach out to us. Rich, I know we have 15 minutes. Ladar threw, threw another question out there. I was just going to quickly answer. Oh, it. yeah, go ahead. That's, I don't want to break any protocols. Uh, Ladar, thank you for your question. How much testing is done to a stream kernel before its release as compared to traditional RHEL slash CentOS kernel updates? Uh, it should have almost the full uh, testing cycle. Uh, all the, the, the CTI testing, all the functional testing is going to be the same across both kernels. Uh, what we do today internally is going to be applied to stream. All the, all the backend soak testing will probably be done on the RHEL kernel, but any problems or issues that pop up there are going to be immediately addressed as CentOS stream kernel, and then it'll filter down the rel kernel and, and verify that way. So um, I would say almost the entire testing cycle will be applied to CentOS stream. It might be applied in the rel kernel, but it's almost identical kernel to the CentOS stream, uh, minus a, a security patch that is embargoed. But it should be almost 100% identical. Prior, do you see it differently? No, I see it that way. It's it's uh CentOS stream kernel is the uh, that's that's the primary kernel. Okay, I think we're truly done. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Last Rich. Week, everyone. No, that's great. <laughs> so once again, thank you so much for this presentation, and uh, thank you to everyone that attended and asked great questions. Uh, we will be resuming in just over ten minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.